Hallelujah. Well, welcome everybody. Listen to me. We we living in some very radical days. In every in every possible way, we living in radical days. We're living in radical days of change here in the United States of America. We live in radical days of change in the in the whole world. I mean, never before has things been so set up as we look over in the Middle East for the, the, the rearrangement of the political structure of things to accommodate what the prophet said of old. Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, what John saw when he went up into heaven, the Lord showed him the things that would come at the end of the age before he came to take his power and reign. These days, these are the days where there must be a radical church in order to deal with such radical situations. I mean, there's got to be somebody who's, who's willing to stand up and begin to move in God with such consecration. Listen, I'm telling you, such consecration, such, such separation unto Him, such commitment to His ways, so absolutely sold out to be upon on His side, changes the way that you speak, the way that you talk, the way that you praise, the way that you sing, the way that you, everything that you do, everything that you believe. Everything that you're about, everything that you want, everything that you desire, everything that you allow yourself to be entertained by, everything that you look to, all your visions, all your dreams, everything about you becomes consumed with His glory and consumed with His presence when you step inside where He dwells. Mm. I mean, Joel describes the army. It's terrifying. I mean, it's not going to fit in any, any, kind of, any kind of framework. I don't care whether people call themselves religious or not religious. It's not going to fit in the framework of what people have thought about God because he's far greater than anything you've ever even thought about. Listen to me. Listen, no clapping yet. Just, just take it from your heart. Just take it into your heart. He's far greater than anything you've ever conceived. He's far, he's far beyond all of that. And his armies, are, his people are so radical. They got faces like lions. They run like horses. I mean, to do his will, you see. To advance those things concerning his cause. To run after miracles, signs, wonders. The power of heaven demonstrated in earth. So it's no longer just stale, lifeless, and overwhelmed by the powers of darkness. And the resistance that Satan would try to erect against all that Christ Jesus did. When he raised up from the dead and was seated at the, own right, at the right hand of the Father. On high, no more disease, no more sickness, no more sin has right, no more power of darkness, no more devil can stand against any power of the Holy Ghost manifested in you and me. Look here, I'm not, I'm not interested in hype and circumstance no more, but bended knee and sorrowful heart. I'm telling you right now, you listen to me. Papa's looking for some people who will show forth his glory in the earth. You and I have to be dedicated and consecrated and committed and responsible that every promise of God's word should be revealed through our life. And he can't reveal the promises of his word when, when, when we've got one eye set upon the world and one eye set upon heaven, one eye set upon our own self-interest and one eye set upon the will of the Father. Jesus said it will not work. He said it will not work. Jesus said it would not work. He said it cannot work. <laughs> he said it cannot work. He said, lest your eyes be single, your whole body will not be full of light. <laughs> he said, if your eye be single, your whole body would be full of light. But if your eye's not single, if you've, got, if you've got divided loyalties, if you've got divided interests, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work. People think that just because God shows up and does some little miracle and somebody gets a, a cancer healed, that suddenly, or there's some moving of his presence, that somehow they have received God's uh, full confirmation when 99% of the other people left the place and they weren't healed. When there's, no, when there's no place within their own life to be more than a conqueror, to overcome sin and iniquity. No, 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 no. Listen, sit, have a seat. No, 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 no. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, Jesus is looking for his works and greater works to be done in the earth and he's going to have himself a generation and I'm telling you right now it's going to be radical. And I'm, you listen, I don't care. It does not matter. If I stand on the high ground of the word, then you've got to listen to me. 
If I stand on the high ground of that which God has said, I don't care what your teachers taught you. There's no teacher like the Holy Ghost. And he's teaching that which is plainly written in the Word. You know, people want to get off on little, you know, little t tangents and little issues. I mean, just get the bigger picture here. I said, get the bigger picture here. Come on now. Get the bigger picture. It's just like when the Muslims start arguing, they want to say, oh, Jesus was a prophet. I say, okay, well, you need to listen to what the prophet had to say. Or the Hindus want to argue and say, oh, he's a holy man. Well, then you need to listen to what the holy man has to say. <laughs> and the Christians say, he's God. Well, you need to listen to what God has to say. <laughs> In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus Christ, we praise you. Oh, Lord, we worship and adore you. Lord, we worship and adore you. Listen to this. Listen, I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture here. Lord Jesus, we worship and adore you. Just give me a little bit of that bass there, just a little bit of that bass. Jesus, we worship and adore you. <laughs> Hallelujah. The only way you can hear the word of God is that you got to be in a state of worship. Huh? The Lord gave a, the Lord worked a miracle for us, and He gave us an anointing, and the anointing He gave us was the privilege and the ability to know Him. Now that's radical, because up until that point, men were cut off from His presence. He gave us an anointing to know Him. And if we give ourselves in dedication to such a relationship to live in him and him and, and, ex, and that, that we would say that this is the greatest richer, riches I could have ever had received, that he would come and dwell in me. See, the Lord invited a people to a celebration and what they did was they took it lightly. They didn't really, it didn't really matter too much to them. Some showed up, some didn't. Some of them showed up half-heartedly. Most didn't. We know how that went down. The Lord has given us an opportunity to come dwell in His presence. The Lord has come to give us the ability to stand and fully represent Him. To have a contrast, to be a light in, the, in, this, in this world right now. So that there is a contrast of people who are completely living in a whole, diff, a whole different culture. The culture of the kingdom of God who have a whole different set of desires and principles who aren't running after the same thing that everybody else is running after who look different who are not sad like the rest of the world but joyful who are not worried and stressed like the rest of the world but full of his good goodness and his peace hallelujah father's looking for somebody who's willing to stand up he's going to have his people stand up listen if you give yourself to this relationship that John talked about in 1 John 2, 27, it will ultimately develop in you having a relationship that he talked about in John 15, 16. That whatever you ask the Father, he will do it. Whatever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, he will do it. Whatever you ask the Father. This is the fruit that God has purposed us to bring. Fourth, people say, oh, I want to see your fruits. I, we'll, we'll know them by their fruits. Well, let's talk about the fruits Jesus demands for us to have. He wants us to have the fruits and the witness that what, we stand wherever we are. We ask the Father to do something, he does it. That's the fruits that he wants. I mean, think about it. Whatever he asks us to do, he, whatever we ask him to do, he'll do it. How about whatever he asks you to do, will you do it? People want shortcuts or they just want to basically uh, have God accommodate whatever it is that they believe or whatever it is that they're doing. I'm going to tell you right now, what you and I need to do is we need to get down on our face before the presence of the living God and take a hold of him until everything he's described in his word is revealed in our life. And if we're not passionate about it, there's something wrong with the condition of our heart. And we're going to have to deal with that. This is a church right here in America, in the Western world, that's going to have to deal with this. I'm talking to you. Listen to me. Don't you think I'm not talking to you? Somebody said to me, my goodness, the whole meaning, all he did was talk to me. Absolutely, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to everybody who hears by web. I'm talking, I'm announcing these things to myself as well. I mean, when you look at what God said in his word, if you're willing to accommodate anything less than what Father said in his word, there's something wrong with that heart. If, we, if we're willing to be or think of ourselves something differently than what Jesus described us to be, what Father described us to be, then there's something wrong with the condition of our heart. And it can be a whole bunch of different things, and we're not going to go into that right now. The bigger point of it is, is what will we do if we find ourselves in such a situation that we haven't believed the report of the Lord? We haven't believed what He said about us. We want to hold on to what the world has said about us. We want to hold on to things that 
that the circumstances and situations of life say about us. I'm going to read you some radical verses of Scripture. And then I'm going to, if, if God allows me, I'm going to get to something that he laid on my heart earlier this morning. And if he doesn't, I'll just get to it tonight. If I don't get to it tonight, I'll get to it sometime in the future. But I'm only going to preach the word. I'm going to preach the gospel. Somebody said, why do you preach? So that you will change. We're going to sow the seed of God's word in your life to see if there's good ground. And if there's good ground, it's going to bring forth fruit. And the fruit the Father wants in all that context and this, that he's described is that he wants us to have such a relationship with him that people will know that we stand in him and he stands in us. Now, that's radical. I mean, people don't want to believe in signs and wonders and miracles, but everything that Jesus did was signs and wonders and miracles, a demonstration of heaven and the power and the glory of God. And everything about the book of Acts that describes the church is nothing but signs, wonders, and miracles, and demonstration of the power of God. And that is just absolutely ludicrous to believe that somehow the Father expects something different of us when he gave to us the outpouring of the Holy Ghost so that we'd go around endued with power, clothed with his majesty to do the same works that he did. And now he didn't even leave it there. And if it was just the same works that he did, then my, we would all have a great responsibility. But he said he's been greater works than these because there's going to be a great glory manifested through your life because of what I have done for you. And so many people sit by and they just happy to be able to quote scriptures and they think it's good enough that they show up to church and give a little bit of a token in the offering. And God says, no way, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go now. And make disciples out of nations. And somebody said, well, I don't need to go because I'm not anointed. Then you got a problem. Then you have a problem. Pro problem, and, uh, problem and, uh, here's the biggest problem. Somebody said, you talk too fast. Well, just you can get the CD and put it on slow speed. Here's the big problem. People are easily justifying their state and condition. People eat. Deception is a powerful force. It will play tricks on your mind and make you believe that you're absolutely right by every analysis that you put to it. That's the power of deception. People, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to the whole church. The Bible of God, the Word of God, the Bible isn't going to change. God's Word is not going to be altered. It's very clear. We, 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 we read it and then we try, to, we try to then, you know, philosophize with it. And we try to make it fit for some certain day so we can be, we can be released of responsibility. We try to put it on some, per, you know, certain group or on certain individuals so that we can be released from the obligation of it. Reality of it is, it was never an obligation anyways. It was a privilege, an opportunity to come lay hold on everything that, de that, that, that defines life. Christ Jesus came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. And most of God's, many of God's people, forgive me, many of God's people live in depression and sorrow because the world has too strong of a hold upon them because they live their life for themselves. You cannot live your life for yourself and have the abundant life that Jesus Christ described. <laughs> you're going to have to be willing to resign. You're going to have to turn in your resignation and say, I'm no longer living for myself. Myself is over. I mean, the Apostle Paul stepped out of, a, out of a realm of living for himself. He gave himself continually all of his life to walking perfectly concerning the righteousness of the law. The man have, would have not had, goodness, in that state he would have had the iniquity that people allow in their lives today. Seventy years ago, the secular world came in an uproar because a movie came out and the movie was called Gone with the Wind and it had one word in it, damn. And the ero and that's the secular world, secular community, not the church. It was in an uproar. And the morality of our society and of our culture has been so eroded that now Christians sit and they partake of things that come right out of hell and they justify it and say, oh, it's okay. And if you don't like it, it's because you're religious. Nonsense. God's called us to a place of walking with him in his light. I mean, the miracle of salvation freed me from the, the desire and the lust that, uh, that, that works in this world. What a wonderful realm. Hallelujah. He gave me a divine nature and set me free from the, the corruption that is in the world through lust. He gave me a whole new set of desires. He gave, me a, he gave me the privilege now to be taught of him, to be led by him, to have all of his ways established in me, his laws, his ways, his thoughts, his ideas, his life, the way he views things, the way he thinks about things written upon the table of my heart and across the tables of my mind. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, we, we, we want to believe something different about what God says, but you're not going to alter or change His Word. And I pray today in Jesus' name you bow before it. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bow yourself before His majesty because I'm telling you it's an awful and dreadful and fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I'm going to tell you right now, you need to spend all of your days fearing the Lord. 
because he's going to give you an expected, a good expected end if you do. I'm going to read, I want to read a bunch of verses of scripture to you. So I'm going to start here in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And really, Paul runs down in chapter 6. He helps people understand that there is a righteous and there, there, are, there are the unrighteous. And people say that there's an unrighteous. No, not one. Twisting what Paul said. Twisting what David said when Paul was quoting him concerning the state and the affairs of men without Christ Jesus, unwilling to walk with God. But here he contrasts very clearly, as he does many times, the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, the wicked and the evil. There is a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of heresy going down around this place. And people are gullible and they're just soaking it up and they're just eating it up hook, line, and sinker. And it's time God's people recognize that Father has come to us and he's brought the light of life to us. And if you come to the light, the light's going to reprove you and then the light's going to instruct you and the light's going to guide you and it's going to teach you not the ways of demon spirits, not how to participate with idols, not how to participate with your own self-interest, but how to participate with God. Hallelujah. See, people have been anointed to do things. I've been anointed to preach the gospel. I've been anointed to preach the good news that we've been liberated from a, a tyrannical master called Satan, whom we also know as Lucifer, the devil, that we no longer have to uh, support his immorality and his iniquity and all the other things that he does to defy God and all the other things he does to curse and destroy men's lives. He's given us, the, not only has he set us free, but he's given us the power and the right and the privilege and the ability to go set others free as well. Watch out because you're going to get entangled. You're going to get entangled thinking that you can edge about all these things that are in the world. It's just going to draw you in. Satan's a master of his craft. Nobody's able to stand against him. There's only one company of people that can. And those are the, that, that, those people who are strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. And I'm telling you, that's knowing how to walk in the spirit and live in the spirit. That's that boldness and that confidence where you and I can call ourselves the sons of God. Where we can be called the sons of God and know the Father views us as his sons and because he's made us his sons. And there, thus we have such boldness to say... Uh, Abba Father, I mean that's how it says in, it says Abba in uh, most English translation. It's actually Avi, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's Avi Father, it's Daddy. It's an obvious Hebrew way of saying Daddy. It's pretty radical, ain't it? Whoa, my 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 my, to just be willing, to be to be willing. Somebody says, let me say, are you telling me that people tell me all that? Oh, you can't live free from sin. And my my question is, where's your heart? I mean, it's not whether or not you can live, ask a question or, or trying to make the statement you can't live free from sin. The question really is, do you want to? That's the question. And do you believe there's power enough being filled with the spirit of holiness and baptized in the spirit of holiness that your whole life could stand in contrast to everything that belongs to darkness and everything that belongs to this world, even as light stands in contrast to darkness? That's the real question. Do you want to? Do you want to be so filled up with the good things of God? Because I'm, too, I'm telling you, when you stand over in that realm, you can't live for yourself anymore. You've got to go. And religion has accommodated you instead of sent you out. I'm going to say that. Hallelujah. I'm going to let you know, religion has allowed you to pursue your own self-interest, but I'm going to blow the trumpet because very soon you're going to stand before the living God. And he's not going to listen to all your statements. And he's not, tell, he's not going to listen to you telling him about how Lord he is, what, the, how much you love him. He's going to judge you according to his word. And, he's gonna, and he said, he said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will come into my kingdom. He, said, he says, those who stop doing sin are going to come into my kingdom. He says to them, he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You never quit sinning. Depart from me, you never quit sinning. I don't know you. Huh? I was reading this morning the prophet Isaiah, you know. <laughs> the, all, of the, all, of, all of Israel was saying, oh, they were telling God how much he was, how wonderful he is and how much they love him and how devoted they are to him and how zealous they are for him and how perfectly and uprightly they have kept his commandments. And he basically says, foolishness, not one of you seek after me. It's you going after only the interest of your heart. That's pretty radical stuff. When you think about people can be so full of certainty that they write with God and Father just absolutely, completely. It's Isaiah 55, I'm pretty sure it's 55 or it's 56. And Father just completely and absolutely denounces them. 
I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to run the risk of being denounced by God. I'm going to pay attention to his word. I'm going to let God, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to get busy doing what he told me to do. And I'm going to encourage you to get busy doing what he's told you to do. Because I look at a lot of people spending their life, not on Jesus, not pouring out their life as an offering to him, but spending their life doing other things. And they're not skillful in the things of the Spirit. It's like musicians that don't give themselves to practicing their music. They're not skillful in music. they got a one or two or three or four or five or six songs, but they're not skillful. It's just the same way in terms of, of functioning and walking in the ways of God. People haven't given themselves to the things of the Spirit. And therefore, they're not skillful in all these wonderful things that Jesus Christ manifested when he functioned in the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, when he functioned in the discerning of spirits, the working of miracles, the gifts of healing, the gift of faith, when he functioned in prophecy and revelation and doctrine. People say, well, I don't need to do that. I'm not a preacher. Oh, yes, you are. If you've been born of the Spirit, you've become a preacher because the preacher lives on the inside of you. He poured out his Spirit upon all flesh, not some flesh, all flesh. Say all flesh, not some flesh. All flesh. Ah, oh, flesh. And we know what it looks like when the Spirit of the living God is poured out upon somebody and is living in somebody. People, it's not that you've got to somehow get God to do what it is that he's already freely done for us and given to us as a free gift. It's really about whether or not you're going to cooperate and participate and quit deceiving yourself and quit joking around with the program. Get yourself anointed by the power of God and just don't walk in obedience to him. Hallelujah. I mean, think about how much, of the, how much of the kingdom of God, if you could just measure, if you just type for a second, I'm talking to everybody in this place. I want you to understand, if you just think for a minute, how much of the kingdom of God and the government of God you actually participate in. Not by your own idea, not by your own perception, not by your comparison of yourself with others, but by what God said in his word. That's a fearful thing, I'm telling you right now. That's a fearful thing. Praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his love that he's here to deal with us. You know, there's some principal things, there's some fundamental things that we don't have to get into details. There's some very fundamental things that he's called us to do. He's called us to come out of darkness into the light. He's called us to come out of the world and into the realm in which of the kingdom of the dear son and be taught of God instead of being taught of men and taught of devils. And so we read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and we read this. Verse 16, in what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wow. Wherefore, he says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And he's already gone through the unclean thing. He's gone through the unclean thing that too many people participate with. I'm telling you, Hollywood, you listen to me. So he said, oh, you sound like an, uh, an old preacher. Well, fine, whatever. Hollywood has by design... Satan's interest in mind when it designs movies it particularly designs them to draw people in to begin to lust I mean commercials are designed I mean what are, what's going to attract people's attention something that ultimately promotes a, a, an act of uncleanness and iniquity called lasciviousness come on people you're going to have to be willing to say at some point in time in your life that I'm not going to participate with that stuff anymore because until you decide it's going to have a hold on you and you're going to be some, to some degree or other a servant of it and will God forgive you if you ask him to forgive you he's amazingly merciful he will forgive you and he cleanse you but then why do you go back to it and if you go back to it if you get sorrowful of heart again will God forgive you when you ask him yes he will but when are you going to stop going back to it that's the bigger question when will you go, stop going back to it when would there be a radical people who set on just doing what God says to do? Who have just said, who with total abandonment forsake their nets and go and follow Jesus? Who, when would there be a people with total abandonment say that I want no more carousing, no more communion? I'm not going to sit with, with the powers of darkness. I'm not going to sell my soul for what I can have in my bank account for when I retire because you're not going to take it with you. You listen to me. Uh -uh. All you're going to take with you is your obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you take him with you. All you're going to take with you is a transformed life, a new heart. Hallelujah. Your tears, he'll, 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 he'll save them up. Those ones where you've been weeping, as it were, between the porch and the altar for a lost and dying world. Where you've been crying out, not for self-interest, oh God, let me have more power so people can look at me. Oh, but God, use me in such a way that the world can be set free. 
I mean, come on, people. There's motives and interests that have not ever really been dealt with because people haven't been willing to come into the light. They hold on to their own life. They hold on to their own opinions. They don't have to agree. They, they, it's the whole, this thing that goes on within the framework of people's interests is they listen and evaluate what the preacher is saying based upon a purely intellectual process rather than allowing the seed of God's word to bring them to a place of their knees where they're crying out to God saying, wait a minute, uh -uh, I know I need to take a hold of God. I know there needs to be greater reality of heaven in my life because there's too much hell revealed in me. <laughs> he says then, he says, I will receive you and I will be a father to you. To have the boldness of walking in the spirit, I'm telling you, have the boldness of being the people of God, having the boldness of saying no. Look, it's a, it, it really, I do see it like this. I see it and understand it like this. God has brought us into the spiritual laws of, of life that are in Christ Jesus. I know that King James translated the laws of the spirit of life which are in Christ Jesus, but the spiritual laws of life which has made us free from the spiritual laws of sin and death. From the laws of sin and death. But people are standing continually in their life, choosing whether or not they're going to exalt their own self-interest, which is short, shortly going to lead you into a place where Satan will have power over you. And you'll never be able to be classified as those who are young men who are strong. The Word of God abides in them, and they've overcome the wicked one or defeated Satan at every point. It, at best, you can only be little children whose sins are forgiving you for his name's sake, which is a great place to be. But where's God's army? Where's God's people? Where are the ferocious folks that stand up? This mighty army, Father. Is going to have it. He's going to have his boast. He's going to be glorified in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And all we're doing right now at this point in time is seeing if there's anybody in the Western world that wants to participate. There's been a few in every generation, but where is the mighty army? Where is the glorious body of Christ, the glorious church that's supposed to be standing up? Where is that, that precious fruit of the earth that Father says the husband hath long patience waiting until it comes into fruition? No, man, we're ready to have entertainment, but how about to have an experience where everything about your life, from the crown of your head, to the soul your feet has changed so much so that you cannot accommodate the way that you've been living another second another second be careful that you don't say amen too loud because if you do then you're held to a greater accountability to do it because if you bow and you swear and you don't perform it it's even worse on your head so I don't mind people being quiet when I preach it's best to think about it huh I'm ready. I'm, I, 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 I'm more akin to D.L. Moody who, who persuaded people, don't you come up here and don't you even make a move towards Jesus Christ and rest thus you're ready to end your life, to no longer live for yourself. Rather than just trying to persuade people, come up because I have got some kind of ego trip going down with the total numbers that I have in the altar. I mean, forgive me if I've offended anybody or hurt anybody's feelings. It's just, just the way I feel. And I've just got to let it, I've got to, I've got to let it out because there's too much hanky-panky going down in the kingdom of God. There's too much nonsense. There's too much, there's too much lifeless events taking place in the church and Jesus isn't being glorified and so the world is not being reached. We talk about the unreached people groups. they all around us, men. And all that's going to make the difference is that somebody, one of us, are going to start step, are going to step into a mantle of the Lord Jesus Christ because we're not going to be willing, we're not going to be willing to allow ourselves to be assimilated into the status quo of Christianity and just go along with the masses and pretend like we're all okay when we're not even coming close to doing what God told us to do in His Word. Somebody's going to have to get aggra aggravated about it. And they're going to have to get aggressive about pursuing the things of the kingdom of God. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. Everybody wants to be Joshua and Caleb, but they were radical men. And if you're not radical, you're not Joshua and Caleb, you're the rest of the folks. I'm just going to put it to you down. I'm going to put it to you like it is. This is the way God anointed me to preach. Somebody said, I'm just so tired of coming over and listening to him preach. He always just preached so radically. That's how I've been anointed to preach, to radically preach. Because God's got to raise up, God's going to raise up a radical generation that's going to say whether we live or whether we die, we don't care anything about ourselves anymore. We're all in. If today we're going to be offered up on a sacrifice of what you believe, Joshua, doesn't matter. Let's do it. Come on, man. That's Israel crossing over into the inheritance. 
Too many people are willing to sell their inheritance for a bowl of beans and act like they didn't make a trade. I'm going to say it again. Too many people are willing to sell their inheritance for some self-interest, for something of this world, for some reputation, for some nonsensical thing that doesn't last uh, but for just a temporal time and then act like they didn't make a trade. Watch out. What you trading every day for? What you trading every second for? I had a person telling me the other day, oh, you can't live free from sin. Uh, you can't live free from sickness. You can't live free from disease. I said, do you think you could live free from sin for one second? And the person said, respond, yeah. I said, do you think you can live free from sin for one minute? They said, respond, yeah. Then I said, live, live your life minute to minute. Start walking in the fear of the Lord. Some people's problem is that they're, they can't say no to alcohol. Some people's problem is they can't quit speaking evil about other people, talking bad about God's folks. Both of them are equally full of iniquity. Both of them must be stopped. Some people's problem is they can't say no to lust and lasciviousness and immorality. Other people's problem is they cannot take a hold of their own tongue. Stop speaking slanderously. Both of them are just as equally wrong and evil. And all really profaning the name of Jesus when it's done in the life of one of those people who are called by his name. Father's not going to have his name profaned anymore. I was telling a friend of mine the other day, God's using in a powerful way in youth ministry throughout the world. And I said, for me, it's like the... I said, just take this loosely, understand it just loosely, but <coughs> for me, it's like this. It's like God's reserved the loss from getting contaminated by us. I'm going to say it again, man, because I, I'm just radical. This is the way it is. Why should, the, why should we go out there, we reach the loss, bring them in here and listen, to, let them hear the, the fight and the fussing and the, and the lack of un, the unwillingness to come into the divine government? The unwillingness to function as the body of Christ. Everybody turned to his own way, doing his own thing, living out his own life, pursuing his own cause. And worse than that, then learn how to be, you know, sinners and saints all at the same time. Oh, I'll take a little bit of, I'll take a little bit of the Holy Ghost and now I'm going to take a little bit of the devil. I'm going to take a little bit of uh, Jesus. Now I'm going to take a little bit of Lucifer. And now I want a little bit of Holy Ghost over here. Now I want a little bit of demon spirit over here. Give me a break. You're going to decide who you are. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> <clears throat> Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Is your heart united to fear the Lord? I look at Father, I, I like to look at Father in the book of Revelation. I love him. Everything about him is his who he is. When he revealed himself to Moses, he said, this is who I am. I'm merciful, I'm compassionate. I'm full of loving kindness or covenant love. I'm, I, I'm full of goodness and truth or faithfulness. But I love to, and that's who he is, but he hates sin. He hates iniquity. He wants nothing to do with demon spirits. He wants nothing to do with darkness. I look at him in the book of Revelation. I like to look at Father as he pours out his wrath upon iniquity because people will not stop committing fornication and immorality. He pours out his wrath because they won't quit lying and cheating and stealing. Pours out his wrath, and I mean he does, he lets it go. If you've been following me in, in the study of the, of the book of Revelation, you, you, you know, I like, to, I like to quantitate things. I like to list things so you can see by the time we're in the fourth trumpet judgment, 58% of the population has been destroyed by one plague or another. 58% of the population. If that were 7 million right now, it'd be close to 4, I mean, 4 billion. If it was, because of 7 billion now, it'd be close to 4 billion. Where do you stack all them bodies? And now, and, and now people are going to stand back and say, oh yeah, but my sin's okay. Your sin's not okay. Your sin is damnable. Your sin, your sin is an act of treason against the Most High. I'm going to say it again. Your sin is an act of treason against the Most High. Your sin nailed Jesus to the cross. It was, his, it was for your sin he died. Now don't trample his blood underfoot and bring it into an open shame and, and, and outrage the Holy Ghost because you think that you can't live right and do what's right. Come on now, man. Where's the radical people? Where are they going to stand up? Where's somebody going to say, I know that all I got to do is say no to that and stop letting lust take a hold of me and stop letting wrong attitudes and stop letting long, wrong passions inspire me because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. It's not in you. The love of the Father is supposed to be in you if you've been born of Him. Yeah. 
All I can say is, whoa, 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 to people who sit and listen to me and don't do what God says. Huh? That's all I can say. Maybe there's churches you can go to where there's not whoa, whoa, whoa. But I doubt it. In fact, I know Father's not going to change or alter his word. I know how he feels about a lukewarm state. I know what he feels. And I'm going to tell you right now, people say, I'm not lukewarm. Watch out that you're not measuring yourself and comparing yourself among others. Because to be on fire means you look like Jesus. To be on fire means that, you got, that you've had the same touch of heaven that took place on the day of Pentecost. Because there is no definition of being on fire or being hot other than the definition that Father gave in Old Testament and New Testament of the fire of his presence which is an all-consuming fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. My job, God's called me to call people to a place of being radically sold out for him. That's my job. God's called me to a place, called me here to preach and testify in it. And I told Father the other day, I said, Father, what you called me to do isn't working. I said, Father, I said, look around. What you call me to do ain't working. What are you going to do? And he assured me he's going to do something. He assured me, he said, he assured me, he said, don't stop. Do not let up. Don't let up. Don't let up. Don't let up. Just keep doing it. Just faithfully keep doing it. Watch what's going to take place. Just stand there. Stand there. And about the time there's nobody else want to listen to you, I'm going to show up big. I'm going to show up big. About the time they've already defined you as completely ludicrous or whatever, you know. I show up. I believe that. I believe that there is a test, an evaluation of our life where Father examines our heart and says, are you for real? He's for real. And I believe that Father in His loving kindness and dinner mercy, though He knows that a lot of people's repentance is nothing but, I'm sorry I got caught, He still is such a merciful God. He's an amazing God. He continues to work with us. And even though it might even be a half-hearted commitment like Ahab had. Ahab was such a wicked king. And yet it was like, he, you know, he just got a hold of himself like he had this moment of reality. And he gets, in, he gets in sackcloth and he puts ashes upon himself. And Father says, look at how Ahab repents. He says to Elijah. And Elijah is just fiery, radically, radically fiery. I believe that he thought that he was the prophet at that moment for the last day. He understood that he was ushering in the kingdom of God and he was all messed up as to why the kingdom of God did not come down out of heaven. That's why he ran out into the wilderness of Sinai. He hadn't, I don't believe he really fully understand how the, understood how the, the Lord would take him up and hold him there now for 2,600 uh, years waiting to send him back to prophesy. <laughs> when he comes back, you listen to me. Talk about the grace of God. Fire comes out of his mouth and consumes all the enemies of the Lord. And they are defined as those who will not turn from their sin and their iniquity. I must say, I must say it again. They are defined as those who will not turn from their sin and their iniquity. Read the book. Read the book. They are defined as those who will not turn from their sin and iniquity. And if they try to mess with this prophet, and they must be destroyed in this manner. Wow. And this is the grace of God that says no more are we going to have sin in this world. See, there's absolute promises. And one of the absolute promises that Father made us is there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And all that's going to be in it is righteousness. And there's a lot of Christians that are not going to fit in there because none of the stuff they like is going to be there. Uh-oh. That's an absolute promise. Then there's conditional promises. And those are centered around whether or not you want to be there, whether or not you want to participate too. I mean, Father's planning something far bigger for our life than what's going on right now. He's preparing us to rule and reign with Him forever, to judge angels, to sit upon thrones, to execute His judgment. There's something going down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I love to get to, you know, when, you, when you're in the book of Revelation, the book of promises, the book of the revelation of God, the mystery of God is very down by seven seals and, and John's weeping because nobody's worthy nowhere to open the book and then he's comforted because he's told no, 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 you don't understand the lion, the tribe of Judah is propelled over the book and he takes off the seals and the seventh seal of course then produces the seven trumpets and of course the seven trumpets then produce, the seventh trumpet produces the seven bowl judgments so it's really the seventh seal that does that but as soon as the seventh seal is, is opened then the book announces in chapter 10 and chapter 11 now the mysteries of God are revealed 
revealed. Now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. For me, that, that I'm living for that now. I'm not waiting for someday in the future. You and I are faced with this decision every day with all the stuff that we encounter. Somebody's going to have to find enough power, enough anointing, enough strength to stand up against the wiles of the devil, to be equipped with all the pop has given to us when he gave us the whole armor of his anointing. The issue is more about the darkness you allow. The issue is more about the demon interaction you're willing to have. John was radical about it. He said, he that sins is of the devil. Really manifesting, because there's a couple ways to look at it in the Greek language. You can't sin without demon power. You can't sin without an association with demon power. Huh. Oh, should you let God take control of you? Uh, there's a lot of people who don't like tongues. <laughs> I'll tell you, rather have your tongue set on fire or heaven than have your tongue set on fire or hell. If you haven't got your tongue set on fire of heaven, I'm sure and certain that it's set on fire or hell. And I would triple, you know, I, I've, I, I've had a hard time doing it, but I've just looked to spot it spot checked this series that they done in the 60s because a very e great evil a last days apostasy evil swept over the world in the 60s things radically changed in the culture of the world in the 60s and especially the western world that led the nations some of it I can't even handle to look at because you know why I see all of these principal people God gave me a gift of discerning of spirits and I see all these principal people from rock stars to various different leaders, women's right leaders, and etc. I see them. I see them so full of demon power that they're same as warlocks and witches to me. They're same as sorceries and, and sorcerers and, and sorceress. I'm just I'm telling you like it is. You can say you can say whatever you want to say about me, but the bottom line of it is they were leaders in one of the greatest rebellions. The greatest rebellion, literally, it is, it, it is anomious or lawlessness. It's rebellion. It's, it's, it's what Satan is all about. He's so rebellious. He doesn't believe that you belong to Jesus. He doesn't believe he was defeated. He doesn't believe he has to live, listen to anything that you and I got to say. He's rebellious. He's, he's full of deception. He's a liar. You got to deal with him that way. He's forceful. Praise God for those who have come under the protection of the Lord and live in His divine protection, His divine keeping power. And all I can do is, oh God, forgive me for every time I allowed any influence of darkness into my life. And I never want any influence of Satan ever to, ever to pierce this armor again, ever to get past the sword, shield of faith ever again. That's what we do. That's got to be the state of our heart. Because if we're saying we're all going to sin more or less every day, you defeat it before you ever got started. You listen to the propaganda. You've already capitulated. You're not engaged in a warfare. You're not engaged in a battle. You're not doing what Jesus did. He said, deny yourself every day. Take up your cross. Taking up your cross is all about the redemption of men. Living not for your own self, but for the will of the Father. Where is that tension in your life? Where is that tension? Because I tell you, I see too many people that call themselves believers, walking with Jesus, following him, and they're well, well given over. Completely consumed by self-interest and the pleasures of this life and running here and running there and doing this and doing that and laboring for themselves and tiring themselves out at the job. And then they bring some small token of themselves to the church. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we want it to be a sacrifice of praise. We want it to be a whole burnt offering. We want it to be everything for you, Jesus. But you know what? I'm good with this. I'm good with this because I believe the Lord is. It's fine to start there, even when you don't, when you don't really mean it. Or maybe it's fine to start there even when you don't know how to do it. It's fine to start there even when you're not consecrated to making it happen. Huh? I'm going to tell you right now, if anybody treated you like you treat God, you'd never be friends with them again. I'm going to tell you right now, if anybody uh, worked 
uh, for some company, the way you work for God, you'd been fired long ago. God's a good God. So just take, just take it like it is. You can say, I don't like that. I'm, uh, I'm upset that he's saying these bad things about me. Or you can recognize it's true and get real. I said, otherwise, you can recognize it's true and get real. And if you can think it's otherwise, you've not read the Bible very well. You've not listed out what God's told us to go and do. You know, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I believe if people take Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 and just live by Matthew 5, 6, and 7, they'd, be radical, they'd have a radical change of life. If they were committed to do what's written in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I mean, a radical change of life. The glory of God would be shining in the earth. People, we're not here talking to you so you get all upset about yourself because all that is is another trick of Satan. We're here talking to you so that your heart would be pricked so you call out to God and repent, sell your life out to Him, depend upon Him every day to make everything that He's purposed and said a reality in your life. Don't be stubborn. Don't be hard-hearted. People sit in church for a long time. All they did, they didn't make their heart soft. They made their heart hard. Why? Because they heard the Word of God and they weren't obedient. They just took it as a sermon. Oh, we went to church this morning, had a sermon. Now is the roast done. Now we're going to have lunch. Now invite the family over. Now we're going to take a nap. Oh, we're too tired to go to church tonight. And that's basically the drill. Should I say that again? I don't want to say it again. And it's just nothing but a religious drill. That's religion. Because the reality of it is, is it really comes down to this. There's a lot of things people are talking about religious. Some people are religious not to have religion. I mean, you know, I don't know, I don't know what is going on. But it's either religion or relationship. And, gee, and the relationship is so amazing. God anointed us to have a relationship. First John 2, 27, he anointed us to have a relationship. A relationship that if we're committed to, it will mature to the point of John 15, 16. That whatever we ask, this is the fruit. He chose it. He, he's ordained it. He called us. He elected it. He, this is what he wants us to be in him. To have such a relationship, to be devoted to a relationship that he says this in John 14. He said, if you love me, then my father will love you. And people don't even get that. What? Is that serious? Are you telling me you got to earn father's love? If you love me, if you obey me, he said, he said, if you obey me, if you keep my commandments, then my father will love you. So he said, I thought he'd love the whole world. He does. But we're now talking about relationship love. We're talking about people who come into the relationship. God's the love of the world. He gave his only begotten son, but he doesn't have a relationship with the world. Do you understand that? He demands that you don't have a relationship with the world either. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? And people can't praise and people can't pray and people can't be fiery because they're contaminated with compromises of sin in this world. And many times when I hear people expressing things that are supposed to be expressions of the spirit, it's almost like I hear, you know, demon spirits being released out of them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just like they're getting delivered in the meeting. And all they can think is that they're moving in the Holy Ghost. I hear, I hear most of it's, what I hear is deliverance. Now stay delivered. I'm happy to have any kind of deliverance meeting. Now just the bigger point is stay delivered. You're going to have to understand how to walk in the ways of God. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to pick, depend upon the Holy Ghost. In other words, to stay delivered. You can go ahead and say radical if you want, because I know you're thinking of it. I just, whoa. Could it be true? It's true. I'm standing here on the high ground of the word, word of God. I'm telling you that it's not, just a, it's not just Paul's testimony, I no longer live. It's the testimony of those people who have been born of the Spirit because you've been bought with a price you're not your own. You've glorified God in your spirit and your body, which are His. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8 and verse, forgive me, Romans, Romans chapter 12, once again. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transfigured by, the thinking, by thinking different about yourself. Do you see that? Are you reading? I pray it becomes such a part of your heart you can quote it. I hope you pray it becomes such a part of your life. It's not just some mental affirmation. People want to have a mental affirmation about God. It's going to get you nowhere. There's got to be a heart change. It's got to come out of your spirit. It's got to come out of a realm where God has been joined together with you and you've been joined together with Him. And you feel what He feels and you think what He thinks. And he's so, he's so amazing, man, because if you fall into sin and iniquity, he's there, he's there grieving your heart. He's there, he's there causing you to understand and come to repentance. He doesn't get up and leave and say, forget about you, you stinky thing. That's what we would do. Forget about you, you rascal, you rotten thing. 
Somebody said to me not too long ago, I said, how can you be so merciful to people? People are just so bad through and through. I said, because God's been so merciful to me. He's loved me and he's forgiven me and he's shown me his grace from the day I, I was born and haven't deserved it. And my, I've been captivated by the way he feels. I feel that way too. I have nothing bad to say about nobody. And if you do, it's because something blinded your eyes and made you arrogant and brought you into league with the spirit of the devil. Because who are you? Who are, who am I? But those in the, redeemed by the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God and kept by His power to where we constantly do things that breach relationship and violate rela relationship. And with open arms, He takes us back and loves on us. I'm more interested in seeing people's spirit get healed than their body. I'm more interested in seeing people get right on the inside than look good on the outside. I believe all the promises of God are ours and we can live in divine health and divine wealth. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'd rather have the riches of the Spirit of being just glorified and beautified with His salvation and His ways than to have anything else in any other realm. And so should you because that's what it's all about. Are you a living witness of the miracle of salvation? You're going to have to deal with it because you've got a responsibility. Are you a living witness of the miracle of salvation and of its results? That he beautified the meek with salvation. He's poured forth his oil of joy upon our life. He gave us beauty for ashes. <laughs> the oil of joy for mourning, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We the trees of righteousness bearing forth fruit unto his glory, showing forth that which he has wrought for us when he, when he, when he gave his life at Calvary's cross, died for us, was buried, and, 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 and rose up from the dead and seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, expecting till all of his enemies be made his footstool. Make sure you're not an enemy of God because he says friendship with the world is an enemy, an act of violation against him and against his kingdom. It's time people kid, stand up, measure up. And be willing to recognize, listen, I've got to be dependent upon the Holy Ghost more than ever. I'm a, you know what? People don't have a passionate prayer life because reality is never stricken the soul. People don't have a passionate prayer life. It's just a bunch of religious obligation because the spirit of wisdom and revelation has never been allowed to open up their eyes. Because as soon as you see what God has required and what he's called us to be, suddenly you're going to look at the contrast that's going on, not comparing yourself with others, but looking and seeing what Father has purpose and what God has designed and begin to cry out to God and say, Oh, Father, change me, do, correct me, do whatever is necessary so that I can find myself living right where you're at. Here's the sad thing. Light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. I'm telling you right now, listen to me. The light of liberation and living in a new, a new way. A way that we can only, it's hard for us even to capture, to capture the beauty and the splendor of it. We call it holiness and righteousness. It's the ways of God. And men see it and there's a liberation and a privilege and an access to walk in it. But men love darkness. They saw the beauty of it. They were invited in. Everybody. God wasn't saying draw not nigh as he did in the days of Moses. When his fire burned upon the mount, he's now saying, everybody, everywhere, come on in. Peace to you that are far away and to you that are near. Come on in. Behold my glory. The light is sprung up. Those who sit in darkness under the shadow of death. Suddenly light has come. The light, Christ Jesus. And they love darkness rather than light. Let me just look at this. Why don't you look at that verse of scripture with me real quickly in John chapter 3. You know what? You cannot defy what I'm saying because I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm absolutely preaching the Word of God. There's no way to, there's no workarounds. There's no loopholes here. You do one of two things. You either harden your heart or you repent. That's it. And the testimony of what you do will soon be revealed because you're going to stand before the one whose eyes are a flame of fire. Who will not in any, who will exact. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we thus persuade men. Knowing the severity of God, we lay out his word as it is written. 
as he said. Somebody said, oh, it's the letter that kills. No, no, no. This is the letter that gives life. He said, my word, hallelujah, is spirit and life. Listen to me. This is the letter. The law is the letter that kills. This is the letter of his word. <laughs> his word is transforming, miraculous word that you and I were born of, the incorruptible seed, the spirit and life. Amen. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Praise God for His goodness. <laughs> hallelujah. The beautiful thing of it is it doesn't matter what shape or condition you're in right now. The Lord Jesus invites you in. He says, come on in. He's not accepting you who, as you are. He's going to change you. He's going to radically change you and make you just like Him. He said, oh, the Lord accepts me just like He is. No, He doesn't. Not one verse of Scripture on that one. He radically changes you. He says, you cannot come into the kingdom until you're born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. A radical change, a new heart, a new spirit. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm saved. Oh, you're saved. Well, good. That's praise God. So you have a different heart than the one you were born with. You have a different spirit than the one you were born with. You've got a, you, all that old stuff and, and a wrong desire. You've got to erase, praise God. And he put his spirit of holiness on the inside of you that now rules over your spirit. In fact, your spirit is so joined unto him, it's heart break away. And if you do, you feel it big time. Hallelujah. Who? Blessed is the name of the Lord. Amen. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Everybody say, thank you, Lord Jesus. For you're so great a salvation. Thank you for your mercy. Without His mercy, we'd all be we'd all be dust. I mean, thank His mercy is new every morning. <laughs> Great is His faithfulness. His faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. He's an amazing God, isn't He? Isn't He amazing? Yes. That He would love someone like you. Yes. <laughs> isn't He amazing that He would love somebody like me? <laughs> that He would call us. He would take us out of the filth and poverty and wretchedness of our state where we were more like the devil than him. And so I'll change you, I'll clean you, I'll wash you up. I'll take all of the reproaches away from you, I'll put my glory upon you, I'll crown you with the crown of my own presence and my own person. I'll give you everything without restraint that I personally own and have. Wow, he's an amazing God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody said, I, I had been to church so long, I didn't know what some of what he was saying. I'm because my Latin is rusty. That wasn't Latin. It's my native tongue. And uh, I invite you to come into my country, into my homeland. And, you know, the best way to learn a language is to saturate yourself. You know, in the language and in the culture. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful language. Hallelujah. It's the language of heaven. It's the language of the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, oh, I thought Hebrew was. Now, this one is. And I, I just want to, I want to, most people know this, these verses of Scripture, or at least a couple of these verses of Scripture, and I just want to remind you of them this morning, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things, and I'm going to release you from this hot building. You can go breathe some fresh air out there. I want to release you from every power of Satan and every influence of the hell. I want to help you to understand you're going to have to learn how to deny yourself daily. And if that's not a practice of your life, it needs to become a practice of your life. And I can't help it that some people made a wrong example of it in the past and people have rejected it hands down because there is a daily denying of ourselves, and it is about us doing what Father said to us to, for us to do rather than us doing what's comfortable for us. You know, somebody said, did, did Peter ever go back home? Yes, many times. In fact, one day after the resurrection, Jesus finds him fishing and he just breaks down he says, Peter, I've got I to ask you a question. He says, what, what? He said, do you love me more than these fish? Which one do you love more, these fish or me? 
What's it going to be? <laughs> and then Peter looks at him and goes, oh, well, of course I love you. He said, no, 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 man. No, come no, no, seriously. What's it going to be? The fish or me? And he's going, but Lord, I love you. Of course I love you. He doesn't, no, 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 listen. You're not listening. Listen to me. I want you to hear this. What's it going to be? Fish or me? And, and now Peter was pricked in his heart. He went a little deeper now. He's like, oh, 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 I get it. I get it. I get what you're asking me now. I, I misunderstood before. You're telling me if I love you, I'm going to go in your stead. I'm going to speak your word and do it just like you did it. Live just like you lived. And you put it in the context of feed my sheep. But feeding sheep can only be understood in the context of Jesus' life. Because a lot of people saying to feed the sheep in the name it doesn't look like what Jesus did. Because he came to preach the gospel to the poor. He got anointed of the Holy Ghost where to buy with, so with a divine power and glory upon his life. He could go and bind up the broken in heart. Proclaim liberty to the captive, the opening of the prison door to them that are bound. To be able to take care of people in every area of their need. And if, and if they're hungry, he's going to let them walk home, take a risk of faint, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to work a miracle and multiply the loaves and the fishes. He's demanding us to speak out of heaven, reveal the will of the Father, to say nothing of ourselves, but only thing to think, to say only those things which Papa says. That is, a, that is a devotion and a discipline and a dedication of your life. That's going to be proven. Father has the right to prove the genuineness of our lives. He has the right to prove the genuineness of what we've said that we're willing to do for him, of the life that we're willing to receive and the life that we're willing to to have. He's come and give to us all the opportunity to have this free gift of salvation. And then it comes down to whether or not we are willing to live it. Do we want it so much? He gave it to us. Now, are we just going to look at it and little regard it and go back to whatever we think in the arrogance of life, self-interest? Help us, Jesus. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. That's verse 16, verse 17. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, to tell the world only that you're... He didn't send his son into the world to say, you're, you're dead. You guys are cut off, in other words. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the powers of darkness. Saved from the world. Saved from the realm of sin. He that believeth in him, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Here's the condemnation. That light, the glory of God, the ways of God, the beauty of his, of, of his holiness has come into the world. And, and we've been given the right and the privilege to live in it. But men love darkness rather than light. See that? Somebody needs to quote verse 19 along with verse 16. Somebody needs to start putting John 3, 19 up at the baseball park. Instead of just John 3, 16. Men love darkness rather than light. Because why? Their deeds are evil. But look at this. Everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Neither comes the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. I want you to know the Lord is going to reprove your deeds. He's going to correct you in his way. And isn't that good? He's going to establish us in his way. But the bigger question is, what are you going to do with his correction? Does his correction fall upon deaf ears? Does it result in only temporal change? Because Ahab ended up dying in his sin. Ahab went back to his iniquity. Ahab went back to Jezebel. Is he going to live out the rest of his life saying, I'm right with God because God in his mercy showed mercy at that moment because people try to take God's mercy as a token and approval upon their life? No. God's word is the very declaration as to whether or not We've been willing to be obedient and go forward with the Lord. Papa is dealing with your heart. I was talking about the rebellion swept over the United States of America and the Western world. Now let me just tell you this. Let me tell you this. Swept over the church too. Because I was with all of those Holy Ghost preachers of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. I sat around the table with them, listening to them tell about the move of God. Some of that I, I was actually old enough to be able to see in the early 60s. 
And in the, in, in, in the 70s, they would talk about something happened in the church. Used, there, they would talk about there used to be a great Holy Ghost conviction in the church. There used to be a reverence towards ministry in the church. And they go on down the list and said something happened in that wave of rebellion. It's, it's influence, it's effect upon the church. It's as though the Holy Ghost has been so grieved, there's just nothing but hardness and stubbornness within the church, ranks of the church. Well, well, one of the things that I've done is I begin to cry out to God, oh God, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Listen, how is it, how can it be, you listen to me, I want you to listen to me. Are you listening to me there on the web? You listen to me by way of YouTube? Are you listening to me here in this place? How can it be that people sit down to eat with the Lord and rise up to play? How is it that people can supposedly come into a move of God and not resolve in the fear of God and holiness? How is it supposedly that people can come into a meeting and supposedly be shaken by the Spirit of the Lord and leave and go commit adultery or go get drunk or go do these other things? Because that comes in context with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, look, you better watch out because you're going to be, he's talking to New Testament believers, you're going to be destroyed by the destroyer. People say, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, then why did he say, talking to Christians, you're going to be destroyed of the destroyers? Huh? Why did Paul say, I do all, I keep my body under and keep it submission, lest I in the end be rejected in a castaway? People have got false hopes that have caused them to live compromised lives. You better get right with God. You better get serious with God. You better not try to hide behind your denominational doctrines. You better not deal with what Luther said or Augustine or some other man. They have not one verse of scripture in the Bible. You better deal with what Jesus Christ said. You better deal with the word that cannot be changed nor altered. Because that's the point. Too many people have been willing. They've taken very little value in God, so they just sit around and they listen and they never applied themselves to the riches of his word to, to say, Lord, search me. Search me, prove me, try me, know me. I tell you, I'm very confident in my salvation. I'm, I, I know my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. I know I am a part of heaven and I'm a citizen in heaven. But I'm going to tell you, I take nothing for granted. I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be vigilant. Because anybody thinks that they're living above deception and living above the snare of the enemy. My goodness, <laughs> that's deception. I'm totally dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm totally dependent upon the Holy Ghost to ultimately do what Father has purposed for me to do. And I'm not, my dependence is going to grow every day. My submission and my surrender to Him is going to become more intense every day. And it's going to be measurable to me. And I don't need to go measure it for everybody else. I'm talking to you. Is it measurable for you? Where's your commitment? Where's your heart? I'm calling you to a place of consecration to God. But somebody said, tell me about the doctrine of sanctification. Tell me about the doctrine of consecration. It's the willingness to completely give yourself over to living the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. To living the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. To living the life of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. All sanctification and all consecration is simply defined within this. Your willingness to completely surrender your life over to God to live the life of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. To live in the fire of His presence. To live in the glory of His person. Father has long patience waiting for the precious fruit of the earth to come forth till he received first till early in the latter rain. I'm hungry for a revival that produces the fruit. I'm hungry for a revival that brings the change. Not people just, not people just howling, crying out, screaming, but well, that may need to be, huh, falling down the ground and falling out the mouth, or you just, or just being overwhelmed by the glory and speaking in tongues and caught away with joy but rising up in a divine power and authority, a consecration and obedience to the will of the Father that everything of the life of Jesus Christ would be manifested in you and me because that's what Father has willed. And he doesn't have two different wills. And he doesn't have Christian A, Christian B, and Christian C. Big Christian, medium Christian, and little Christian. It's just one call to one life. Hallelujah. My God, It's just that many people in the kingdom of God have never got out of first grade. They never got out of first grade. They just stuck in first grade. And now they're sitting around in the church after being in the church for many years and stuck in first grade and acting like they know something. I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to raise up somebody who's been six months in the kingdom of God that are going to graduate to get a Ph.D. in the kingdom of God. While you're sitting there saying you know something, they're going to go do something. 
And I pray that you get provoked to jealousy. I thought only Israel was going to get provoked to jealousy, but now I find out that much of the church is also going to be in the same company, being provoked to jealousy because somebody comes in who lived radical for the world that was looking for something real and genuine, and suddenly they were touched by the power of God, and they rose up and said, I'm not going to follow you guys. I'm going to follow Jesus. And all of the things that Jesus did and all that Jesus said <laughs> is going to also be revealed in their life, and I'm going to tell you right now, they're not going to get ahead of me. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be in the company. I'm, just, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to cry out all the more. I'm going to cry out all the more. When I see anything in my life that is not conformed to the will of Jesus Christ, that is not, be, everything I see in my life that is not fully all that God wants it to be, I cry out, Jesus! Thou Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on me. I'm going to sit around and act like I'm okay. Not when I can see too many things in the Word of God, too many things in the will of God that I've not stepped into yet. I'm, that's my passion. That's my burning fire. That's my fuel. Huh? That's my oil that burns through the night. Huh? That's why I go to prayer. That's why I'm in the meeting. It isn't works. It's love. <laughs> it's not trying to earn something. It's dedicated to having what Papa purposed. That's love. It's, not, it's, it, it's a dedication to not being left out of all the good stuff. No way am I going to get left out <laughs> of the good stuff. I'm going to be right at ground zero when the glory of God begins to move once again with great power and authority. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm not going to read all these verses of Scripture. I'm almost done. I'm going to just show you two verses of Scripture real quickly. Okay? Two, two verses of Scripture real quickly. I want you to look with me in Proverbs 23, verse 17, 18. I know you can quote it because the Word of God is in you. That's why you're strong and have defeated Satan at every point. I mean, I'm so blessed. My wife, she's constantly got new scriptures pinned up all over the house. I get up in the morning, that the, the Bible is open. I mean, my goodness, the, the, the Word of God is laid out there before us on the table. Goodness. Praise the name of Jesus for having people full of the Holy Ghost around you. Uh, you want things to be better in your life, get people around you that are full of the Holy Ghost. And you start being the one that the people are going to be around full of the Holy Ghost to begin with. Are you with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. You begin. It says, but be in the fear of the Lord all day long. See that? Verse 17, but be in the fear of the Lord all day long, for surely there is an end and your expectation shall not be cut off. Just be in the fear of the Lord all day long. The teacher has come. The mentor is here. He's the Holy Ghost. He's come to help us. Somebody said, oh, God, help me. Help is, on, is not on its way. Help has come. Help is here. The teacher, mentor, God himself has come to show us how to do this. Now, one other verse of Scripture, Psalms 25, verse 5. Psalms 25, verse 5. Be in the fear of the Lord all day long. Somebody said, oh, fear the Lord, that's the Old Testament. Well, you must understand, fear of the Lord is part of the sevenfold anointing of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 11. God anointed him with God, anointed Jesus Christ, Jesus the only man who came to the planet born with a divine nature other than Adam. The only perfect person that has ever lived, the only man that has completely and totally defeated sin at every point, was anointed with the fear of the Lord. Sevenfold anointing, the spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of understanding, hallelujah, huh? strength and the fear of the Lord, praise God. Be in the fear of the Lord all day long. Somebody says, I'm trying to have the fear of the Lord. You need to get anointed of the Holy Ghost. You need to receive the new birth. You need to receive Jesus right now. I tell you, he's standing at the door of your heart. He's knocking. Chad, listen to me. This is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, listen, the church needs to hear it's time to receive the life of Christ. Everybody thinks it's sitting around in the life of Christ. Look, it's time to receive the life of Christ because it's a very different life than people have been living. The life of Christ is beautiful. The life of Christ will be a light. The world will come running. See that light? 
they'll come running. There's too many people who haven't got to see that light. If they realized that you could live this kind of a life, they'd be in here by, by, by the hundreds of thousands. I see it coming. There's a day in the not-too-distant future. There's going to be a people that are going to rise up. The glory of God will be upon them. The reality of Jesus Christ in their life. And they are going to influence the entire earth. There is going to be one of the greatest moves of God. One of the greatest harvests that have ever been seen. We will go and it'd be as though a fire burns before us. And, and a fire around us. And, and it would be as though all of the earth is a huge garden. And we, we bring in this harvest. It's like a men offering. Like a whole burnt offering. So that there's nothing left. It's like a wilderness behind us. That kind of a harvest. What does it take for the Lord to prepare me? What does the Lord t- take for the Lord to prepare you? And, and, and Paul said to Timothy, he said, those who have, who have purged themselves from all of these things, the doctrines of men is in the, is in the group, along with all the other stuff that belongs to this world, then they are meet for the master's use, or they're, they're able to be used by the, the master, prepared unto every good work. It's time, dear people. It's time now. Japan, I'm telling you, you listen to me. You guys are so anointed for Japan. Um, the Lord loves to take people that, that are small and insignificant in, in, in their own eyes and in everybody else's eyes and show the glory. So don't even be, don't even, when you get back, don't even, don't even let up for a second. God's put you in charge. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth and he put you in charge in Japan. I say you're in charge. You know how many youth are sitting in houses and don't even come out of the houses? Can you imagine what will happen if you start getting a, 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 a ministry set up to where the, it, you're broadcasting into all of those living rooms where, the, where 30%, I think it is, of the youth of Japan sits dep- depressed and have no social interaction with people? You, can you imagine what happens when the anointing strikes them on their, on their computer screen? Japan has not have, Japan's not been touched by the gospel. It's a free society, a republic, and it's not even touched by the power of God. It's as, it is as bad off as any place on the planet where you're not allowed. It's as bad off as Saudi Arabia. It's as bad off as, as the Sudan or Kashmir. Because we haven't been living right. It says because we haven't been living right. Because we've been sitting around singing hallelujah, still doing what God told us to do. Because if we did what God told us to do, we'd have far more impact upon the earth. 120 changed the world. One man stood up and turned the world upside down because he was sold out to Jesus. His name was Paul. And he's not some special, unique person in the kingdom of God. This is a life that God called every one of us to. And, and he stacked the word of revelation up on it so that nobody can be in doubt about it. Listen, I'm not going to let you escape your responsibility. I'm going to call you into greatness here today. Forgive me why I, why I call you into greatness and tell you who you are and, 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 and demand of you to live in that place in this, of his divine goodness and grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I'm also tell you, hallelujah. Matthew chapter, or forgive me, Psalms chapter 25. Here it is. I'm going to just close with this. 25, 5. Here it is. Lead me in your truth. Teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. And on you, I wait all the day, all day long. How you walk with God? Do you walk with God day by day? Do you walk with God hour by hour? Or do you walk with God minute by minute? Or do you walk with God second by second? Does he feel your seconds? It's time to let him feel your seconds. Instead of walking with him by, day by day, because he might only get like maybe 10 minutes. He might only get 10 minutes of passion out of you. He might only get 10 minutes of attention out of you. He might only get 10 minutes of obedience out of you. You think you, it was, you were obeying God just because you went to work? Do you think that God is going to impre- be impressed by your savings account? Do you think that God is impressed by your degrees? Do you think that God is impressed by all these things that we measure success in the United States by? Give me a break. What Bible are you reading? What Bible are you reading? Yeah, yeah, but preacher, 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 there is one verse of Scripture in those tens of thousands that you're talking about that says we're supposed to be fervent in business. I mean, just trying to find some way to salve your irresponsibility. No more in Jesus' name. Because there's 10,000 Scriptures already told you what business you need to be involved in. 
Oh, but preacher, there's scripture says you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of your own family. Well, Jesus said, take no thought for your food <laughs> and what you're going to wear, but go after the kingdom. Get passionate about the kingdom. The kingdom's not in your life. Be hungry and desperate to have it there. Well, come on now, I'm going to break this stronghold down, this nonsense Western idea of plaque, hate myself, exalt myself, and say I'm right with God nonsense. It's time for the church to receive the life of Jesus Christ. It's time for the church to receive the life of Jesus Christ today, right now. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just passionate. I'm not angry. I'm passionate. I'm not upset with anybody in here. If you don't get right, someone's going to be upset with you on a scale you cannot tolerate. And his name is the Father. He's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. You never did what was right. And I never knew you. That's what he's going to say. Do you think the father is going to look at Elvis Presley and say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Elvis. He gave his life to the Lord when he was like 10 years old. He sang in the choir till he was 16. Till he was about 19 years old, 18, 19, he was with the Blackwood Brothers singing gospel music. But he died in his sin and his iniquity. Give me a break. And nothing, the Bible has nothing to say that. Yeah, no one, we, God is in his mercy and grace. Father has given you as a gift to Jesus. And no power can pluck you out of his hand. But if you're not willing to obey God, you're not right with God. It's period. No power can pluck you out of his hand, but you can be unwilling to be obedient and you can ultimately, yourself, decide you're not doing it God's way, you're going to do it your way. And all the excuses, oh, oh but we had to plow a new ground. and The but first... But first, Jesus said, come follow me. Okay, I'm going to follow you. But first, but first, but first, let me go take care of this. But first, I need to do this. But first, huh? The Lord said, you're not taking care of my house. Oh, because how can we take care of your house when our house is empty? When we haven't built our house yet, we better all take care of ourselves. Then we can help you out, Father. He said, he said, that's miserable. Because where it really comes down to about trust. Father's going to take better care of you than you can ever take care of yourself. Father's going to resource you better than you can ever take resource yourself. Father's giving you a life, an abundant life. I'm going to tell you right now, just, I want you today, today I'm calling you right now by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm calling you to leave your life and come follow Jesus. I'm calling you right now to lay down all those things that you grasp so, so tightly. And it's beginning with the self because it's a state of the heart. And when you're willing to do this, when you're really willing to do this, everything begins to change. The burdens begin to go. The things that have held you back, the things that have kept you from functioning in the anointing, the things that have kept the signs, wonders, and miracles, the demonstration of the power of God in your life is suddenly broken off you. And you immediately step in to a divine connection. Oh, dear people, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to close this. I want to tell you right now, I believe right now that the church needs to repent of its rebellion. We watch people who have no rebellion in their life, they immediately get full of the Holy Ghost. They immediately touch that realm of heaven. They get connected with that realm of heaven that produces those results. That people think that they can practice or train themselves to be, no, no. It's rebellion. There's rebellion in people's lives. There's hardness in people's lives. There's stubbornness in people's lives. They want to have it their own way. They want to believe it like they want to believe it. Just repent. That's the beauty of it all. All I got to do is repent and say, no, Lord. I don't be stubborn no more. I don't be rebellious no more. I don't be hard-hearted no more. I want to go all the way with you. I want to do it your way. I surrender all to you. He's standing at the door of your heart. He's knocking right now. Will you let him in? You've got to deal with this. Christ Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. He wants to come in. He wants to be master. He wants to take over every desire. He wants to take care over every emotion. He wants to take over every passion. He wants to take over every purpose. He wants to give you a heavenly vision. He wants to cause you to see that there, your life is far more meaningful than anyone ever told you or that you, any, any thought you ever had about yourself. He's standing at the door of your heart. He's knocking right now. He wants to empower you to live for Him. He wants to empower you to... Shine as a light in a dark world. He wants to bless you in a way that you can't even begin to imagine. And he's made it so simple. He's made it so simple. Just with a sincere heart. Because one day God is going to prove... One day God is going to prove sincerity. 
One day he will prove truth. And he wants it to be established in our life right now. Just with sincerity and truth in your heart. Say, Lord, my life, I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm not calling the shots anymore. I'm not going to have it my way anymore. I'm not going to live by the doctrines of men, the doctrines of my own ideas. I'm going to live by the simplicity of your word saying, come, take up your cross and follow me. I want everybody to stand with me. So the anointing of the Holy Ghost is here in this place right now. I want you to understand, the Spirit of the Lord is here at this very moment, right now. He will establish all these things that He's purposed. He will come alongside of you and keep you in the way. In Psalms 25, it's a great psalm to study. He will teach sinners in the way. Well, yay, the meek will He guide in His way. Hallelujah. He would, yes, those who, are sta- those who desire truth, the established in his way. Matthew, the Psalms 25, God's promise. But my, the problem is, the tension is, is that so many people don't want it God's way. They want it their way. As I was saying earlier, and I've got to say this. I can't get away from it. I cannot get away from it. I'm trying to get away from this. And, 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 and I just keep seeing it flash up before me in Isaiah. And I'm just going, because I want you to hear this. This this is so, Satan has set up such fortresses of deception in people's lives that it's almost like there's no way for the truth to get in. It it, it is, it is, it's it's a heart-wrenching thing to think of. Here's what he says in Isaiah 58. He said, They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness, as the people who forsook not the ordinances of God, they asked for me the ordinance of justice, and they take a a delight in approaching unto me. But here's what he says. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, show them my people their transgressions show them they aren't anywhere near me show them their sin because until you recognize it until you recognize it until you be willing to deal with it because there's i'm telling you there's churches there's a lot of churches here today this morning there's a lot of churches people are gathered together in the name of the lord jesus and they have no commitment to doing what God says. And of course, you read Isaiah 58, you can understand primarily the Lord brings it down to... You know what He brings it down to? Listen to this. He doesn't bring it down in Isaiah 58 so much. He doesn't bring it down that they were doing, having, committing adultery or fornication. You know what He brings it down to? He brings it down to this. The relationships with each other were wrong. Their relationships with the priest and the temple were wrong. Pretty radical, huh? I'm going to listen up. Jesus is calling you. Listen up. He's made it real easy for you to repent. He just simply, so he said, tell me, pastor, tell me, how do I repent? Just consecrate your heart. Just, con- just open up your heart. Consecrate. Say, Lord, I surrender all to you. And just begin to consecrate your life. Because Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. The Holy Ghost is pleading with you. It's not hard. This isn't hard. You have nothing for you to figure out. All you have to do is respond and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm not going to do it my way. I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not gonna, I don't want to be deceived. I want to do it your way. Hallelujah. This is a bodhidai. But if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to humble yourself, then the, the, we, the bottom line of it is he can't guide you in the way of truth. If you're not willing to be broken before him, say, search me, O oh God, try me, know my thoughts. And he does that with his word. Just begin to, just, just begin to let him... Right now, just let him be all in all. Let him say, okay, no, I'm not going to hold on to myself, my fears, my worries, my torments, my pains, my money, my nothing. <laughs> I, surrender, I just lay it all at your feet. Because that's really the repentance that God is calling for. This, I'm, I'm going to do it your way, God. I'm gonna be, I'm, I want you to teach me how to have right relationships with the people that are around me, my husband, my wife, my children, my parents, 
people that are in the, meet, the church. I want to know how to have the right relationship in every way with you. Father, I'm giving myself to be taught by you. I want to do it your way. <laughs> you can begin to just tell the Lord, Lord, you're not going to be second anymore. You're going to be first. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just, there's people in here right now. You know there's call of God upon your life. God's talked to you, but you've been unwilling to do it. <laughs> Father pointed out to you things he's wanted you to do, things that he's called you to do, but you've been unwilling to do it. You said you'd go over and again, but you didn't go. You said you would do it, but you got too busy with all the other cares of your own life. Now, this day, now, this moment in time, just repent, and the Lord, the Lord will get you right back on track. There is no option B for you. The call of God remains the same. The same thing God called you to when you first began is nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. He loves you so much you can't even begin to imagine. He loves you so much you can't even begin to imagine. I'm standing in his presence. Something, I don't want it to be aloof. Five more minutes. Just, just a few more minutes. I just want you to do, I want you standing here in the presence of the Lord. You came to church. Church means you came to a place to meet with God. If you didn't meet with God, you didn't go to church. It's time for you to meet with God face to face. He's here. It's time for you to meet with him face to face. It's time for you to meet with him face to face. It's time for you to begin to deal with to save your soul one-on-one. -on -one. It's time for you now to come to the throne room of grace with all boldness by the blood of Jesus Christ and stand there and hear from Him exactly how He feels about things. It's time that there be relationship on that level. And I, and I command this in Jesus' name in your life. Hallelujah. Listen, he, who, who, I feel, I feel people, re, I feel people responding in this place. Some of you that, you, I mean, goodness gracious, you've like deferred the call for way too long. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves us. Let me just say this as well. If you've got sickness or disease in your body, the Lord Jesus will take care of it right now so you don't leave this place with pain in your body. You can, it, it's amazing. You can leave here sin-free, pain-free, disease-free. <laughs> if you just receive what he has to give you, you can go forth in peace, be led forth, go forth, be led out in peace, go out in righteousness, joy. And the mountains and hills will break forth through the singing before you. Just a few more minutes, just two more minutes or so. Were you standing one on one with God? Some of you, I don't know what you're standing with. Because you don't look like to me like you stand in front of God, but I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna leave it alone. You know, but I'm just trying to get to you. I'm trying to get at every one of you. I'm just trying to get at every one of you. I'm trying to get at your heart. You got to deal with God. You're going to deal with Him one day. Might as well start dealing with Him right now. You're going to deal with Father one day. You can say all you want to say about how you got it all squared away, but His Word declares it and reveals it. And it ain't going to change. Relationship declares it and reveals it and that can't be altered that's it that's it. I feel the anointing over here I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit I feel the fire of God some of you are willing to just go ahead and just 
stand here and let him examine you and just tell him that you, you, all your life is his. Let me say this. I'm going to say this. You cannot say you've lived your whole life for Jesus and not have the results the Bible says you're supposed to have. You cannot say you've lived your whole life for Jesus and not have the same ministry of Jesus revealed in your life, these works and greater works. You cannot say that. And if you do, you have been deceived because it's just simply nonsense. You could say something like, you know, I've been in church all my life and I've wanted to do what's right. But you're not being honest. Because when you live your own life for Jesus, every one of his promises is going to be revealed in your life. And all I'm doing right now is I'm dealing with you that you would surrender your life to live your whole life for Jesus so that from this day forward, you can go on a road of growth and maturity so that all that he has promised will be revealed in your life. I'm telling you, they're, I'm, gone, I'm praying, I'm believing God for a great awakening. I'm believing God for revival. And that changed church with pe God's people getting right and being real. And it isn't, there, there, listen, dear people, there's, there's no sense of condemnation. It's just a sense of surrender. Hallelujah. Just, just a, it's a conversation with the Father said, Okay, Papa, I'm living for you from now on. I'm pursuing those things which you told me to pursue. I spent my whole life living for me, but now I'm going to live for you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. One more minute. One more minute. One more minute. Just one more minute. You stand before God. You cannot say you went to church unless you met with God. And I just want you to meet with Him. You've heard from Him. But when I say meet, I want you to interact with them. Just one more minute. You just tell Papa. You just define to Papa what you... Here he's here. He's here. You know what? I, you know what? A woman named Hagar had something revealed to her. And I'm going to quote it in King James English. Thou, O oh God, seest me. Thou, O oh God, seest me. Hagar, just a bond woman who did not have the right child, who was rejected and sent out, not allowed to be raised with the son of promise. She had a revelation. Thou, O oh God, seest me. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? Because I'm telling you, your life will change when you do. I'm going to tell you, your life will change. I'm going to tell you, you won't live for yourself anymore. I want that God wants to open your eyes. Thou, O oh God, Thou, O oh God, seest me. Thou, oh God, seest me. Thou, O oh God, seest me. You, you, O oh God, you see me. He sees you. He sees you. To become aware that you stand before His presence, to become aware that you stand face to face, that He's that interested in you must demand that you no longer in any way ignore him. I feel revival. I feel the moving of God. I feel some of you grabbing a hold of the things of the Spirit and dedicating yourself to having everything that God has promised revealed through your life. That everything he's spoken in his word is going to be revealed in you because you're going to take hold of him and you're not going to let go. Thou, oh God, seest me. Thou, oh God, you see me. I know I said five minutes, so we've gone past five minutes, but his presence is so glorious, compelling. He loves you so much. He gave his whole life for you. Just respond and give your whole life to him. Well, amen. Amen. I want you to live just like this. Don't depart from it. Live like this. Don't depart from it. Live like this. Don't depart from it. Because this is the only way that you will overcome the world. 
This is the only way that you'll be an overcomer. God writes to the overcomers. He said, those that overcome, even as I overcame, they will sit down with me in my throne, even as I sit down with my Father in His throne. There's only one way. Walking here in this place of relationship with Him. Right now, in Jesus' name, everything about your life is different from this day forward. Just believe it. Hallelujah. Live it. Listen, we want to invite all of you, give you an opportunity to come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. We do this as worship. We don't do this for any other reason. But the beautiful thing about this, this worship where we begin to take what we have and we say, Lord, I want, I'm going to take my life and I want it to be used for your kingdom on every dimension, financially, every way. Father works a miracle. When we begin to give him just a little bit, he gives us a whole lot more. Think about this on this side. The scripture says if you give generously, you should also reap generously. Imagine if you gave your heart and your life generously to him. Your time. Imagine the harvest that comes of what he's going to produce with respect to the manifestation of his life through you. Think about it. Finances, the money is only a token of it. But it's worship. And nonetheless, it's still an act of faith that produces a miracle of financial blessing too. So just come and worship the Lord with your giving. Hallelujah. And if there's anybody want prayer for anything, if you've got a need, you want me to pray for you. If you don't know that you're right with God, if you don't know that you've had a new heart and a new spirit, if you've got pain or sickness or disease in your body, if you have some kind of an addiction that you're dealing with, you got some kind of problem in your life, I'm here to pray with you and for you. The Lord will touch you. That thing will be broken off of you. Everything Father has will be realized by you. Amen. He's promised that he'll do it. So you just come, we'll pray for you.